So you guys didn't get invited to the lake either, huh? You know, you know what they say about a boat anyway, right? It's, you, you know, the, the best kind of boat is to have a friend with a boat. Um, so nobody in here is your friend, okay? Because you don't have a boat, you can look at next week's, next week's crowd. We know there are a lot of people, you know, out boating and, and they're probably chiming in online. And so we just want to say to you, we hope it runs out of gas. <laughs> But I'm glad you guys are here. All right, we're going to have fun today. We are in uh, part three of our series called Legacy Families. We started this series a few weeks ago, so let's just kind of unpack some of the things that we've said uh, so far. We said everybody has a family, and every family leaves a legacy. And there are really two kinds of legacies that we can leave. It's kind of a legacy of dysfunction, or it's a legacy of redemption. And the difference between those two things is, is, a, is a fine word called intention. Intention is the difference between a legacy of dysfunction and a legacy of redemption. We said that a lack of intention can lead to a legacy of dysfunction, but a little intention, if we just give it a little bit of intention, it can lead us to a legacy of redemption. And one of the easiest things we can do, one of the most intentional things we can do for and with our family is this. We can pray for it. All right, we can pray for legacy. Uh, th- this, is, this is the cheapest thing you will do. This doesn't cost you anything uh, to do. You can pray for your family at no cost to you. It's one of the most convenient things you can do. You can do this anywhere. You can do this in the car. Okay, keep your eyes open, but you can still pray in the car with your eyes open. Uh, you can do this uh, while you're shopping for groceries. Um, you can do this when you're sitting in a meeting at work, wondering why you're even in the meeting to begin with. Anybody having those kinds of meetings? Uh, I have those. I'm usually the one that's leading them, okay? Um, <laughs> My favorite meeting is the one that gets canceled. That's the kind of meetings uh, I like. But hey, if you're ever sitting in a meeting going, why am I here? Just shift gears and go, let me just use this time to pray for my family, to pray uh, for legacy. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, that we should pray without ceasing, pray continually. And prayer is the easiest thing that we can do as parents. It's oftentimes the most neglected thing that we do. It's oftentimes the last resort uh, instead of the first thing we think about. I became a dad 15 years, 11 months, 26 days ago, and here's what that means. Uh, I have not known what I'm doing for longer than some of you. Uh, I have not known what I'm doing for um, less than the rest of you. Uh, I'm a novice at not knowing what I'm doing. Some of you are experts at it. Uh, some of you are amateurs uh, at it. The rest of you are grandparents. You, know, you, don't, you don't care anymore. Like pick them up, sugar them up, love them up, give them back. So <clears throat> our kids are the biggest responsibilities that we have. Mom and dad is the, is the most important title Uh, that we have and parenting is the most difficult job that we had and none of us had any training for it. Uh, Think about your education. When you graduated high school, you you were educated for about 2,600 days. If you went to college, an additional 720 days. If you got a master's degree, another 360 days. And even then, you struggled to get a job because you were well-educated but under-experienced. We became parents with no formal education, no prior experience, and they let us take the kids home after two days. You, you do the math on that. Like, we're just supposed to know what to do. So I've been a dad for about 146,000 hours. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, Outliers, if you've read that, he says it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything. All right, so you want to be an expert golfer, 10,000 hours. An expert pianist, 10,000 hours. An expert gymnast, 10,000 hours. An expert bricklayer, 10,000 hours. An expert parent, good luck. Not enough hours in a lifetime. I got 146,000 hours under my belt. I still don't know uh, what I'm doing. I still feel inadequate. I still oftentimes feel like a failure as a parent, but it's not all our 
fault, guys. Have you noticed that we are slower on the uptake than any other species on the planet? I, I held a, um, I was at Cincinnati Christian School on Thursday. I held a two-week-old chinchilla. You know what a chinchilla is? I did not know what a chinchilla, I thought it was like something on Taco Bell menu, right? So, <laughs> you get sour cream with that, but it, it's like a little rabbit, and, 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 and she, um, she, they, they know what to do. Like, after they're born, they just have everything they need to go and be a success in the little world they're in. And you think about birds, like mama bird feeds the little baby birds for like two or three weeks and then pushes them out of the nest and fly or die, little bird, and good luck on your own worms. And that's a parenting model, right? Just throw them out. But it takes us, think of it, it takes us like a year or more to learn to walk, and it's not pretty. It takes us about a year to be able to, to use the ambidextrous thumbs we were given to eat, and only like 50% makes it in. The rest of it's on our face and on our shirt and the floor. You know, it takes us like three years before we can talk. We're in the nest for 18 years and, and those of you who have graduates, like you just went through graduation and you're, you're grieving because they're leaving, listen, I got good news for you. They will be back. <laughs> so it's just like a four-year hiatus. They will be back just when you're getting used to it. Or like, I'm home. You know, you're getting ready to turn their bedroom into a walk-in closet and they just walk back in and... Uh, there goes your plans. But we're slower. Like we're slower than all the other species that God created. Why is that? Um, you know, he created animals with the instinct to survive. But he created us with a, with a, little, more, uh, a little more complexity. He, he created us for intimacy to thrive. See, animals just know what to do. But we need a little help. We need a little help. God created us for relationship. He, he created us to be dependent on him and interdependent with other people. If I could do everything on my own, I wouldn't need the relationship. But we're not just raising kids. We are making disciples. And we can't do that without a village of people around us to help speak truth into our kids when they won't hear it from us. And we certainly can't do it without the power and strength from the Holy Spirit. And I think one of the reasons that we feel inadequate as parents, because we, we all do, and here's why, because we are. We are. We can't fix our kids. We can't solve their problems. We can't make their decisions. We can't eat their vegetables. We can't take their sickness. We can't change their outcomes. There's a lot that we uh, can't do, but there's a few things that we, we can do if we're intentional. And that is we can, we can leverage other people, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks, and we can certainly pray. Uh, you're not going to be a perfect parent. Nobody's going to be a perfect parent, but we can't afford not to be a praying parent. Uh, Mark Batterson has written a couple of books on prayer. One is a circle maker, and then out of that book, he wrote a small little book called Praying Circles Around Your Children. In that book, he, he writes this, prayer turns ordinary parents into prophets who shape the destinies of their children, grandchildren, and every generation that follows. That's being intentional. And with a little intention, it can lead to a legacy of redemption. Prayer is the thin nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. Parents, if you want, if you want your hand, if you want God's hand to move on, on your kids, you, you gotta move heaven on your knees. Because when we pray, God moves. God acts. He doesn't always move in the way we want him to move. He, 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 he won't necessarily move them to the, to the college of their choice or your choice. He may not move them to the career of their choice or your choice, but God will always move them to where they can be most effective and most impactful for the kingdom. That's the kind of prayer that God answers. And so we have to be willing as parents to pray like Jesus, not my will, but yours be Done. God knows better, and wherever God's leading is always better than where we're going on our own. And when we pray for God's will to be done in the lives of our kids, God stands ready to honor that prayer all the time. Here's a passage from Lamentations. Uh, chapter 2, 19, it says, Arise, cry out in the night. As the watches of the night begin, pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Lift up your hands to him. For the lives of your children who faint from hunger... 
at every street corner. Let me give you a little context to this passage. Jerusalem had turned its back uh, on God, and this was kind of the MO of the nation of Israel. Constantly moving toward God, then, then moving away from God. Moving back to God, then turning back away from God. And Paul says in Romans 3, none of us seek God. Right? We're, we're all generally moving in the opposite direction of where God is trying uh, to move us to. And Jerusalem had this relationship with God and God finally said, fine, have it your way. And he removed his presence from the temple and enemies defiled the temple and then the city walls were destroyed and uh, Jerusalem was left exposed and unprotected because God had removed his favor and a famine broke out in the land and children were starving from hunger at every street corner and the night was divided into uh, three, four hour periods. And this passage is an, is an exhortation for the people to wake up to stand up and to take watch over their land, to repent of their sin, to cry out for God for the sake of their children because he's the only one who could reverse the curse. And after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, Israel got a new start and Jerusalem began to rebuild. And, and here's how that applies in our context today. There's a cultural invasion taking place. You don't need me to tell you that. You can see it with your own eyes. Satan is leading the charge. And parents, we have to stand up and keep watch over our children. We need to be standing on the wall of prayer for our kids because the only thing that is going to protect them from the flaming arrows of the enemy is the mighty hand of God. And prayer is the pavement that leads to that kind of power. It doesn't matter how old your kids are. It's never too late to pray for them. If you've got younger children, like, you, you know, you're, you're, you're now a little ahead of the curve of, of most of us. You have time on your hands. But I want you to know, for those of you who are parents of older children, it is never too late to pray for your kids. You cannot get back the time, but you can leverage the time that you have right now, no matter how old your kids are. The greatest gift that we can give our kids is the gift of a praying parent. See, when we pray, we are doing more than giving God permission to be involved. Prayer is this. It is inviting God to partner with us as parents. God's a gentleman. He won't go where he is not welcome. That's why he pulled himself out from the nation of Israel. Have it your way. You don't want me? Let's see how that works out for you. God's a gentleman. He doesn't go where he's not wanted. He doesn't need permission to do anything, but he will rarely do anything without an invitation. And when we pray, God RSVPs and steps in and he partners with us as a parent. We, we, when we don't pray, we're essentially just saying, listen, God, I got this. I don't really need the help. I'm good on my own. Now, we wouldn't say that out loud, but that's what we tend to say unintentionally when we don't do the easiest thing that is handed to us, and that is tap into the power of God to give us insight and wisdom, it may be hard to believe, but God loves your children more than you do. He wants good things for them more than you do. He wants to shower them with grace and peace and blessings more than you do. He wants them to be a success in life more than you do. He wants them to have healthy relationships more than you do. Listen, we conceived our kids, but God knit them together. Look at Psalm uh, 139. This is a, a familiar passage to many of you, David writes this, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. The thing that you wrote down yesterday the thing that you journaled because you didn't want to forget, God remembered long before you ever thought about it. God's been writing a script for centuries. He knows our kids better than we do. David goes on. You've searched me. 
You know me. You know when I sit, when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways before a word is on my tongue. You, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. I can't perceive my kids' thoughts from afar. I I have no idea what they are thinking before they speak it. I will never know my kids the way God knows my kids because I did not knit them together. He did. And if God knows them better than I do, then I better ask him for some wisdom. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says in the little letter that he wrote to the Christians the other day, chapter 1, verse 5, he says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God for it. And he goes on to say, and he will give it to you. You lack wisdom, ask God, and he will give it to you. That is a prayer that God is guaranteed to answer. You need wisdom for your kids? Ask God for it. He will give it to you. God probably is not going to give you the winning Powerball number, but he will give you wisdom if you will ask for it. Which one is more important to your family? If we spend as much time praying for our kids as we did worrying about our kids, we could change a generation And most of us are carrying a burden today over our kids that we need to lay down. Some of you have kids with significant health problems. I know uh, in this church there are parents who are are concerned deeply for their kids and their health. And I have no idea what it's like to walk in your shoes. But here's what I do know from God's word. Worry won't heal them. They won't. Some of you have kids dealing with depression and anxiety. I can tell you this from experience because I've walked in that and on that path. Worry won't comfort them. Some of you have kids who are running with the wrong crowd. You know it. You can just see disaster in front of them. Worry will not convince them. Some of you have older kids. They're getting ready to get married and you, you, there, there's a in, parent's intuition like this is not the right person. You know it, but you're not going to say anything. You're just going to keep worrying about it and worry won't stop them. Worry is the, is the least effective parent strategy on the planet and probably the one that we utilize the most and it doesn't change anything except the color of our hair. Right? And some of you are worrying. I see it. Okay, Paul gives us a better solution in Philippians chapter 4. He says this, do not be anxious about anything. Don't worry about anything, anything. Well, it's easy for Paul to say he didn't have kids. (laughs) Gotta be kidding me, Paul. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Pray. And here's what happens, this beautiful exchange. When you pray, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, like you'll, you'll never figure all of this out, it just is above our pay grade, it transcends all understanding, it'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That, that's the trade-off. We can lay down worry, exchange it for prayer, and then God gives us peace, which we can't figure out. I don't understand why I'm so at peace with this thing. I should be totally stressed out about it, but I'm not. Why? But, well, I prayed about it, and somehow God gave me peace that I can't reconcile. And it's guarding my heart. It's guarding my mind. See, prayer conquers anxiety. That's the exchange that takes place. Satan tries to convince us that worry Worry is the right thing to do. Let's worry about them. And Jesus says this, who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? How many of you have gone through a situation with your kids that got completely better because you worried about it? I'm a better worrier than you are, I bet. It's a spiritual gift. Right? And, it, and it, has, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't add anything to my life. In fact, the word worry, when Jesus uses that word, the Greek word literally means to choke. Right? So when you worry, you are choking the life 
out of you. You're not adding anything. You are taking something away. And so since worrying hasn't worked, what about we try a different strategy? Uh, Stormy O'Mardian wrote a book called The Power of a Praying Parent. You may have heard of her. She's written several books on prayer, The Power of Praying Wife, The Power of Praying Husband. And she wrote a book on The Power of Praying Parent. And and here's what she wrote. She said, my husband and I recognize the hand of God on our children's lives. And they readily acknowledge it as well. For it's the power of God that penetrates a child's life when a parent prays. And they don't even know it's happening. Prayer is acknowledging and experiencing the presence of God and inviting his presence into our lives and circumstances. It's seeking the presence of God and releasing the power of God, which gives us the means to overcome any problem. When we pray, we're not only giving God permission to get involved, we're extending him an invitation. And if God knows our kids better than we do, We want to get him involved, and prayer is the vehicle. So let me just give you a couple of challenges today as it relates to prayer. Number one, pray for your kids daily and specifically. Like if you're raising kids, you know this. Like every day is different. The battle is different every day. And if you have more than one child, you know it's multiple battles that change day in that day out. So pray specifically for what your child is in need of that day, whether they are three or 33. Pray for them. Pray specifically for what's going on. If they're taking a test, you pray for clarity of mind. If they're interviewing for a job, you, you pray for peace and discernment. If they're struggling for a relationship, pray for wisdom and pray that God would shield their heart. Ask them, ask them this. Ask them how you can pray for them. Let them fill in the blank for you. And they know that you are praying for them. So ask them, what can I pray for you about? What can I take to the Father on your behalf? And in and, and, and addition to that, you're, you pray for their salvation. You pray for them to know and to love and to serve Jesus. Pray for their future spouse. There's power in that. Outside of their decision to follow Jesus, who they decide to do this journey called life with is the most important and most permanent decision they will ever make. So you as a parent can bathe that in prayer. Uh, Mark Batterson in the book, The Circle Maker, tells a story uh, about some friends of his who uh, found out they were pregnant And uh, they began to pray uh, for their baby. They didn't know if it was going to be a boy or a girl. They didn't want to find out. So they just started uh, praying. And in October 1993, God gave them a girl's name, Jessica. So they thought they were going to have a girl. And so they're praying for for Jessica. And then in uh, December, he gave them a boy's name. And they're a little bit confused. But he laid the name Timothy on their hearts. Now they're praying for for Timothy. and, and, And they're praying for Jessica. And a few months later, it's a boy. Timothy was born, and from that moment on, they prayed for Timothy's future spouse. 22 years later, he marries a girl named... Had you guys read the book? (laughs) Jessica. Guess when she was born? October 19th, 1993. What a coincidence. What are the odds? See, we can leave our child's mate to fate, Or we can take it to the Father. I dare you. Take it to the Father. Pray for their engagement in the kingdom. I want you to just raising kids. We're raising warriors. We we are raising difference makers for the kingdom of God. Don't pray that they had find a a good job with great benefits and a six-figure salary and a 401k. Pray that they would be engaged in the work of the kingdom, whether that leads them to a corner office downtown as a CEO or to the four corners of the world as a missionary. Don't pray for them to have an easy life. Pray for them to have an effective life. Don't pray for them to be happy, healthy, and wealthy. Pray for them to be holy and sacrificial and generous with the kingdom of God. You're not just raising kids. You're making disciples who are going to make disciples who are going to make disciples that's going to ripple out for generations. See, the Great Commission starts in your living room. So pray for your kids daily and specifically. Next, pray with them regularly and intentionally. 
Jesus did not teach his disciples how to pray by preaching a sermon or by uh, recording a podcast. He taught them to pray by praying. He prayed out loud in front of them. And, and some things are better caught than taught. And prayer is one of those things. And when you pray with your kids, you are teaching them how to pray. And I know some of you are uncomfortable with praying out loud in front of other people. So here's my advice to you. Embrace the unnatural until it becomes normal. Don't back away from the unnatural. All of us want to back away from the unnatural. We don't grow that way. We grow by leaning into it. So you lean into the unnatural and eventually it will become normal. And that's how you teach your kids how to pray. Your prayers don't need to be hallmarked. They just need to be honest. There's no magic words that grabs God's attention. There's no magic phrase that cause God, causes God to perk up and go, oh, this person is serious. You don't have to have a theology degree to pray. Here's how I know you can pray out loud. Because you pray in your head. So whatever is in your head, just speak out loud. If you think you've got to pretty up that prayer, then you're not talking to God. You're talking to somebody else. God doesn't need pretty. Just wants honesty. So get in a rhythm of praying with your kids. Embrace the unnatural until it becomes Normal. At our house, we usually pray before uh, bedtime. Sometimes we'll pray after we eat dinner and we'll just hang out around the table and, and uh, we'll uh, ask, you know, what is one thing that you're thankful for? And then we'll go around and what's one thing we can pray for or who can we pray for? And kind of share that time together. And I'll be honest with you, there are nights when it is a chore, not just for my kids, but for their dad. I am not always in the mood to pray. Uh, you can live a spiritual life without always feeling spiritual. But it's important to do spiritual things whether you feel spiritual or not. See, sometimes praying with my family is duty. All right, but, but, but there's nothing negative about duty. We just have to do it. And when we do the things that we don't necessarily want to do, it eventually leads to delight. You're not always going to feel it. But that doesn't mean you don't do it. So whether you're feeling it or not, the investment in those moments will pay dividends for generations to come because the most important vision casting we do as parents is on our knees with our kids. You want to cast a vision for your family? This is how you do it. You fall to your knees and you pray for them, and you pray with them, and they will catch the vision. This past Thursday, I was at a fundraising banquet for Pathway to Hope, which is a, a crisis pregnancy center in Hamilton that we're connected with, partnered with, and support. Many of you are familiar with their work, and, and some of you were there on, uh, on Thursday night. And a guy named Josh Andrews was the keynote speaker. He's a younger guy. He's the head basketball coach of... Uh, Taylor University and grew up in this area and he just shared uh, his story very transparently uh, that his mom and dad uh, are from this area I guess moved to Richmond Kentucky so that he could go to Eastern Kentucky University his dad and try to get a good job to, to or try to get an, an education to get a good job to um, to raise his family support his family they had two young kids at the time they had no income no income and life was stressful, and it was tense all the time. And then they found out that they were pregnant with their third child, and he just kind of lost it. And he said to his wife, he wanted her to get an abortion. And he said, if you keep this baby, I'm leaving. And she's in a tough spot. You know, do I, do I keep the baby and lose the husband, or do I lose my husband and become a single mom with three young kids? And she was a Jesus follower. Her husband was not uh, a Jesus follower. It's one of the reasons that Scripture says don't be unequally yoked. Because if you're unequally yoked, you're typically not on the same page spiritually. And this was the case in their household. And so it created tension. And she did the only thing that she knew to do, and that was to pray. And, and Josh said that she prayed for four things specifically. Number one, she prayed that he would stay. Number two, she prayed that the baby would look just like him. 
Uh, number three, she prayed that he would bond with the baby. And number four, she prayed that the baby would lead him to Jesus. And God started to, to melt the stones around his heart. He began to soften. He stayed. The baby was born. He bonded with this with this baby in a unique way. Josh said, I did everything that my dad did. If he mowed the yard, I was walking right behind him. Uh, I listened to classic rock because that's what he listened to. Uh, I played basketball because he loved basketball. I went to the gym uh, with him uh, to play basketball. Uh, he, he said that I, I knew all the sports stats of every team out there because my dad was so into that. And so I just did everything that my dad did. He said that you know, he was the image of his father. And eight years later, his dad became a follower of Jesus. And his dad was there uh, on Thursday night. And I'm just kind of watching him. I'm in, I'm in the back. I just keep eyeing over here to see how his dad is responding because that's, that's a lot to unpack in front of a lot of people that you don't know. And then he said this. He said, Dad, I've never said this before, but I'm going to say it in front of all these people tonight. Thanks for staying. That was a moment. That was a moment. And that family is leaving a legacy because a mom hit her knees in prayer. She cast a vision for her family on her knees. Listen, prayer is one of the greatest gifts that God gives us. When we pray, God moves. When we fall to our knees, God rises up in power, and we would do well to take advantage of that power. It starts with us. As moms and dads, as grandmas and grandpas, as aunts and uncles, if you don't have kids, it starts with us. On our knees before our father, on behalf of our sons and daughters, our grandsons, our granddaughters, our nieces, our nephews. Legacy isn't just something we leave behind for our family. It's something we build with them every single day. And if we want to build a legacy of redemption... Starts on our knees, praying honestly for God to give wisdom and strength and courage. Uh, outside today, just like we have for the last few weeks over here in the cafe, there's a, there's a chalkboard. And uh, we'd love for you to go over there and write out, like, what's, your, what's your legacy? What legacy do you want to leave for your family? What's your vision? You can, you can write it out as a sentence. You can write it out as a prayer. Like it's something that we can look at and pray over uh, on your behalf. It would be our privilege uh, to do that. But again, this is, this is us coming together and, and leveraging the village of people here to learn from each other. So take advantage of that before you uh, leave today. And you can see the other ones above the door right over here and, uh, and stop and, and read those as well. But before we leave, I just want to spend time on my knees uh, for you guys. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray for, for every person in this room who leads a family, whether it's a mom or dad or a grandma or a grandpa or an aunt or an uncle who has stepped in for a child whose mom or dad are out of the picture. And there, there are folks in this room today who are fostering kids. And I just pray, Father, right now that, that you would speak into them, that you would encourage them, that you would let them know how important their role is. That you would let them know that you are writing a story. That on this side of heaven, they will not see the ending to but that they would simply be encouraged that you're writing it. That you would remind them that the child that they are raising, that you love them even more than they could imagine. Would you remind them that you are a God of power? That you're a God who sees further? that you're a God who sees above the day-to-day -day mess and the chaos that we tend to live in and then define as our reality, that you're a God who's bigger than all of that. 
And so, Father, I pray for every family in this room who wants to leave a legacy of redemption. I pray that that you would equip them by the power of your spirit. I pray that you would drop people in front of them who become their village, who can speak truth into the lives of their children that, that oftentimes gets lost in translation when we speak it as a parent. I pray, Father, that you would lift everybody's vision today and that we would see the most important thing in front of us is not the house we live in, the car we drive, the job we work, school we attend, but it's the people that we share a home with. And I just pray, God, that that a generation and a culture would begin to change because a little church here on the corner decided we wanted a change in our homes and that we want the God of creation to create something new. So thank you, Father, for your love, for your kindness, for your grace. We will make mistakes every day and every day your mercies are new. And help us to live in that. Not the regret of the past, but the power of the present and the hope of a great future. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.